Hello, I'm John Powell, and this is another session of our Oral History Project with the Legislative Reference Bureau, talking with previous uh, members of the legislature. And our guest, we're very happy to have with us, former State Senator Lynn Edelman, who was a Democrat representing New Berlin from 1976, when he was first elected, until appointed to the federal bench in 1997 by President Clinton, where he now serves in the Eastern District of uh, Wisconsin uh, as a federal district judge. So thanks very much for joining us. Nice to be here. And well, give us a little of your background, uh, where you come from and how and why you got into politics. Well, first I should say that I didn't just represent New Berlin. I represented a suburban district. New Berlin was one of the maybe 20 or 30 different towns and villages and cities that I represented in the state senate. I actually had little pieces of four counties. Uh, I had a, a pretty good chunk of Milwaukee County and that varied over the years because of redistricting but I had uh, different times. I always had Greendale and I always had most of Franklin and at some point and I always had Hales Corners and there were certain points where I had um, um, Greenfield or parts of Greenfield but then there were other times when I had parts of Oak Creek so that was the sort of the Milwaukee County part of my district and I always had a chunk of Waukesha County when I first started it was a huge chunk in fact the district was mostly Waukesha County it went all the way out to Oconomowoc and Heartland and the Lake Country along with New Berlin and Muskego and the city of Waukesha and a whole lot of towns and uh, Actually, when I first started, I had little parts of Jefferson County, too. Exonia, um, Concord, and Sullivan. So, and then those ultimately got changed in redistricting, but then I got thrown down into uh, Racine and Walworth County. So, at various parts, so, and I, I, in fact, I live in Racine County and still do and have a, had a pretty large swath of Racine County west of the interstate, that is, town of Waterford, town of Rochester, town of Norway, and then over in East Troy. And so it was a kind of a sprawling suburban, exurban district, uh, southwestern, the southwestern region of, of uh, metropolitan Milwaukee area is what I had. And, and um, so when you, I just wanted to sort of expand on what I represent. Legislators know their districts. That's one thing you can be sure. Well, <laughs> you, you, you do it. You don't. If you if you don't know your district, uh, I suppose you don't know it at your own peril. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and that was particularly true in my district because I was a Democrat, and the district was sort of, I was always much more politically Republican and. Uh, so I had to know it well, and I spent uh, lots and lots of time sort of being in the district with constituents. Um, how I got into all this? Well, I guess I was always interested in politics, and I always had an impulse to change things, and I was always pretty liberal, probably mostly uh, inheritance from my mother, but also due to various life experiences and you know I was a to some extent uh, to some extent sort of came of age in the 60s and early 70s and those were times where there was a lot of ferment and a lot of ideas were talked about and so I uh, I started out in politics actually uh, running for Congress that was in 1974. That was my first political campaign. And I, at that point, I lived over in the North Shore of Milwaukee. I lived in Shorewood, actually. Although I hadn't lived in Shorewood very long because I actually had lived in New York City for about nine years. I, I grew up in Milwaukee, but I went to college in the East. Then I went to law school in the East. And then uh, I practiced law in New York for a while. And then uh, it was actually in when I was in New York that I thought maybe it would be interesting to try politics and to come home. And so then I moved back to Wisconsin in the early 70s. 
and started, got into a law practice with a couple of other people. And, but I was real interested in politics, so I started running for Congress in the old 9th District, in, uh, which was sort of a northern, northwestern, it was northern suburbs of Milwaukee and then western suburbs of Milwaukee. It sort of swept around. It was Shorewood, Whitefish Bay, Fox Point, Bayside, Ozaki County, Washington County, a huge chunk of Waukesha County, part of Jefferson County, and a little even a little bit of Dodge County around Ashapen and Lebanon and Neosho. I don't know if you've ever heard of these places. But um, anyway, so I ran for Congress in 1974. My, my strategy was to run against an incumbent whose name was Glenn Davis, who was a kind of a, he'd been there a long time, and I sort of saw him as being kind of over the hill. He was a Republican. Very, very conservative Republican, a close ally of, actually, of Nixon, and um, very, uh, kind of uh, very kind of hard line, nothing uh, reform-minded about Glenn Davis. He was certainly old school. And, uh, but he'd sort of, I think, he'd sort of run out of, the times had changed. And his old kind of gruff, blunt, you know, very ex ex pretty, I would not extreme, maybe, but very uncompromising right-wing style, I think, was going a little out of style, especially with some of the younger suburbanites who were conservative, but not in the same way he was. And um, so I thought maybe I could, uh, maybe I could develop something there. And actually, I did. I started running, and I got some people to back me, and I was thought I was making a little headway maybe. And then a, a state senator from the North Shore suburbs of Milwaukee, he was actually from, I guess he was from Fiendsville, a guy named Bob Caston, who was then in the Wisconsin State Senate and had been for not very long. And he took a look at the whole situation and he decided that uh, maybe he could knock Davis out in the primary. And uh, Caston was a little, that was a little different. The Republicans don't usually run against incumbents in primaries. They're usually a little more, I think, uh, deferential. But Caston was, uh, he had his own approach and, and he knocked out Davis in the Republican primary. And I wanted, there was a Democratic primary ultimately and I won the Democratic primary, but my whole strategy of that it would be a good contrast for the electorate between me, kind of young and energetic and so forth, against this kind of, quote, over the hill. That was how I tried to portray Davis. I mean, that was a pretty good plan, except it didn't work if, if Davis gets knocked out in a primary, and so then I wound up running against a guy who was younger than me or close to my age, and it was just kind of a, you know, a, a, a Democrat against a Republican. Well, that was not a good race for me because this was another very Republican-leaning district. And so we ran hard, and I had a good time. And, um, uh, but I lost, I think it was about 55-45, which was actually quite, quite a substantial uh, achievement for a Democrat in that district. I mean, you, you think about the counties that I've that I uh, just triggered off that were in that district, um, there, there was not any place that was uh, really democratic. The city of Waukesha, I got 57% of the vote in the city of Waukesha against Bob Caston. I carried, I almost carried Washington County, including West Bend. I did carry West Bend. In those days, it was the you know, early 70s, there were much more, those, some of those towns were much more blue collar. There were f factories in Waukesha that were, had a lot of blue collar workers and same in northern Waukesha County, even some of Port Washington area. It was a much more blue collar 
And, and so uh, a Democrat could make a few, you know, a little headway in certain parts of those, of that district. So, I mean, now it's changed a lot. I think many of the factories have, are no longer the mainstays, they've closed. The districts have gotten much more suburban and exurban. It's a much more kind of, oh, there, there's very few little blue collars, not as much, not as much blue collar as there was then. And, it's more sort of conventional suburban and exurban and and uh, so now those communities are way more Republican even than they were then. But they were very Republican then too. So I made good headway, but I lost. So then it was uh, 1974, November of 1974, when Caston beat me. So Caston, by the way, went on to win, of course, in Congress. Then became, then ran for governor. Uh, unsuccessfully, then was elected to the U.S. Senate, so we should just... Yeah, no, Kasten had a good political career. I mean, he, you're right, he ran, uh, he was in Congress, I think, two terms. He was always a young man in a hurry. Mm -hmm. And uh, he ran for governor in 78, and then at that time he lost in the primary to Dreyfus. He was a big, Kasten uh, was the heavy favorite. He was this congressman, kind of boy wonder, had a lot of money, all the North Shore kind of financial, Republican financial kind of apparatus was behind Caston, but Dreyfus got his red vest and his uh, gift of gab, and he, I think Dreyfus might have had some kind of a school bus or something, and he would go driving around the state, and he kind of caught on, whereas Caston seemed kind of Caston was never a guy that people warmed up to. I mean, he was a good, he was good at figuring out the nuts and bolts of campaigns, but he was never Mr. Warmth. And so Dreyfus kind of caught on, and then Caston was, uh, got knocked out. But then, you know, as you say, then in 1980, two years later, Caston came back and in the Reagan landslide of 1980, and Caston, uh, took out uh, Senator Gaylord Nelson in 1980 by a very small margin, and then Caston stayed in the U.S. Senate for two terms, and then in 1992, he himself was defeated by Russ Feingold. So, yeah, I guess I've been uh, watching a lot of this over the years. So, um, so anyway, back to 1974. And yeah, how did you campaign then? <coughs> how did I campaign? Well, I just went to shopping centers. And in the 1974 race, I just kind of went out and shook every hand I could find and went to plant gates and went to shopping centers and went to any place there were people and church suppers and rotary chicken dinners and <coughs> I just showed up a lot. And it was a pretty good year for Democrats, 1974. That was the Watergate year. So I, I had a, a, I got some help from that. But even with the Watergate year, the district I was running in was just kind of too much. Did you spend much money? Not really, maybe. I mean, I guess I spent a lot for what campaigns were then. But it was, I think the total was probably less than 100000 for the whole congressional seat. And I didn't really know much about television, and I was afraid of it. And we did a few TV ads, but they weren't very good. And, you know, I guess I probably didn't have a good professional, you know, consultant. <laughs> I mean, I had a lot of smart people helping. My campaign manager was Mordecai Lee, um, and uh, there were a number of other people that were involved in that campaign that went on to hold positions in in city or state government. Paul Henningsen, who was a longtime alderman in Milwaukee, was my press secretary. We had a pretty good crew, but um, it was pretty amateurish. I think that. I, th I don't think campaigns quite had, has got quite as professionalized then as they are now. It was way, so it was a lot of grassroots stuff. I liked the campaign. 
I mean, I like them better than all the TV campaigns now, but, you know, times have changed. Um, so then what? <clears throat> well, then I had to figure out what to do, because I, you know, I didn't have any office. <laughs> I still wanted to be in politics, but you have to get elected somehow. And uh, so I went and talked to a few people, one of whom is presently back in the state assembly, an old friend named Fred Kessler, who was actually elected to the assembly in, I think in 1964, the first time. I think he was like the youngest person ever elected to the assembly. I don't even think he was old enough to serve when he first got elected. Mm -hmm. And now he's about the oldest person. I mean, and he totally and he left. In between, he served as a judge. In yeah, he did a judge. He ran for Congress a couple times. He did a lot of things, and then he came back, and now he's in the assembly again. But anyway, so he knew a lot about politics and stuff, and so he said, "Why don't you think about running against an incumbent Republican named Jim Devitt?" And he represents this district, the Senate district that I described earlier, which was mostly Waukesha and had some of Milwaukee County and then a little of Jefferson. And, uh, and I said, well, why would that be a possible good thing? Because that was a pretty Republican district too, although that Senate district was, in, from a Democrat standpoint, better than the congressional district because they had all those little communities in Waukesha County, I mean in Milwaukee County that I told you about, Franklin, Greendale, Greenfield, and in those days those communities were more democratic than they are now. Again, it's because they weren't as affluent, they were more, you know, blue collar and so forth. So I was single then. I lived in an apartment in Shorewood, and uh, so I thought, well, and also see, a lot of that district I had already run in, because I was in the congressional campaign, so my name was known in lots of the district, which is a big help. So I said, okay, that seems like the most logical thing to do, and uh, that was going to be uphill too, but you know, you can't just decide, you know, you're limited by circumstances and stuff. So I, I got an apartment in New Berlin, which was sort of the center of that district. And I just moved out there and um, started running, which basically means, you know, again, going around to the places where people hang out and John Shabazz, that was, but I remember about the first week I moved out there, I ran into John Shabazz, who was the state rep from out there and very conservative Republican, and he was the assembly minority leader. And he saw me out there and started glaring, what are you doing here, you know? And, and uh, so, um, so I started running, and if, if maybe I had been sort of unlucky in my first race, the congressional race, because you know, my plan was to run against Davis, and then suddenly I was running against Caston, which was much tougher. So you could maybe say that was kind of a bad, bad stroke of bad luck for me. But the luck certainly changed in the uh, state senate race that I had embarked on out in New Berlin, because my uh, the incumbent Devitt, who was this sort of moderate Republican, he got into a lot of trouble. And ultimately, I don't know if we have to go through all the gory details, but anyway, he got convicted of a felony 10 days before the election in 1976. And uh, that's always sort of a boost to your campaign when your <laughs> opponent gets, gets, gets indicted just before the well, election. Well, no, he wasn't indicted. He was convicted. convicted. <laughs> he, uh, he had been, actually what he had done is he had run for governor in 74 in the Republican primary. And uh, he was sort of the moderate as opposed to the guy who ultimately won, which was a guy named Bill Dyke, who was the conservative. But Devitt had taken some money, a contribution from a guy who ran a nursing home. And he had, it was like a $10,000 but you only, the, the limit, the maximum any individual could give then, I think, was like 1000 
And so what he did was they just, they, they, they divided up the 10,000 and put various people, employees' names. This is something that is not that uncommon. I mean, it's not common, but it's the kind of thing that people get in trouble for, where one f sort of wealthy person gives more than he's allowed to and parcels it out on the reports to employees, and then the, the, somebody finds out and it's illegal. And um, Devitt, I think, could have pleaded guilty to a, like a misdemeanor or something not too major way early. But Devitt was a very, I guess he wanted to vindicate himself. He thought he was right or he hadn't done anything wrong. And he was also, I think he had a pretty high opinion of himself. So he was on trial for weeks all during the summer when I'm ringing doorbells which is also kind of a advantage when you don't have to very really say anything about your they just the you go knock on somebody's door and they say who are you running against and you say Devitt and meanwhile they're reading the evening paper and it's all about Devitt's trial for money laundering or something so I didn't have to say anything bad about him because the newspapers were doing the whole thing you know without me and um, did you have a Democratic opponent? No, I didn't, um, although I was, see, that's another place no Democrat would have ever run because it was really conservative. And uh, Devitt had a primary, though. He had two primary opponents, and he managed to win the primary. I was so happy that he run because it's, you know, because the other guys would have been kind of guys who didn't have any ethical baggage. And I, I, who knows if I could have won without that. So, uh, so anyway, uh, Endeavor was popular among local officials. I actually that was a very interesting campaign because he got convicted. He got convicted by a jury of felony, you know, whatever it was, campaign finance laws, and. Uh, even at, this is like uh, maybe two weeks, 10 days, something like that before the election. And even after that, a lot of local officials and school board members and all these people that, that liked him, that he wrote letters supporting him. I mean, they would say, oh, David, we know David, this isn't such a big deal, this conviction. And, and I was kind of like this carpetbagger type you know, I'd come over from the North Shore, and I was this liberal guy, and so they, they tried to, and so they all wrote these letters. I was just amazed that these local officials and mayors and stuff would write public letters to their constituents supporting this guy who's just been convicted of a felony. I mean, I was just stunned by that, and I thought, am I missing something? Am I going to lose to a convicted felon? You know, is that what's going to happen? And I actually didn't know. And I, but I learned something from that race. And what I learned is sometimes that the voters have more sense than some of the people that they elect. Because uh, I won, like, I got about two-thirds of the vote. I think it was like 66% to 34. And it was clearly they were throwing this guy out. They didn't want to vote for a guy who was a you know, who'd just been convicted of a crime and, and uh, you know, and they repudiated all these letters, I mean, by their vote. So, I mean, I, 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 mean, I don't know, I, but I was just stunned that these local officials would actually put themselves on the line. What Chris, do you think they did? Was it ideology or just... I think they were all they pretty, knew the they, they knew them, but they also were really strong Republicans. They were just Republican. And, you know, uh, to some of them, I don't know, to some of them, a, uh, a convicted Republican is better than a liberal Democrat. We, we uh, did an oral history with John Shabazz recently. Yeah. Uh, very conservative. He hasn't changed. Right. He must have been awfully annoyed when you won and kept winning. Well, it wasn't long because Shabazz, uh, I won in 76, and... Uh, Shabazz got the judgeship, I think, in the early 81 or 82. So he wasn't really there. Reagan got on the bench, and Reagan got the president in 80, and there was a vacancy in the, in the federal judgeship in Madison. And even though Shabazz lived in the eastern district of Wisconsin, see, where we lived, in our district was 
that was the Eastern District, and the Western District is Madison, but Shabazz was a big Reagan loyalist. I think he might have been chairman of the Reagan campaign here. In 76 he was. He was, okay. So, uh, so Reagan's going to put him on the bench in Madison, even though he's not even from that district. And um, so I had about, I guess, six, five, six years where Shab I was the state senator, and Shabazz was the assemblyman. That was actually sort of funny because, um, because uh, see, I would always run, I would go door to door like a madman. I rang more doorbells in those 20 years than I bet anybody in the history of the Wisconsin. And because uh, that's all I did was door to door. And my theory was that if you went to people's door and they met you and talked to you, now there's a few hard, you know, there's a certain percentage of hardcore party loyalists that it wouldn't matter if you went to their door 50 times. But there were a huge number of people that maybe they leaned Republican, but if you showed up and showed an interest and went to their door, you could, you know, they would vote for you, you know, and, and so that's, that was my strategy. I went to a lot of doors. And, um, and I also totally played down party. In the 20 years that I was in the state senate, I never once had my party on my literature. Never once. And I always, I always ran on sort of nonpartisan issues. I mean, I never, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I ran on somewhat, you know, conservative issues and... For example? Ta you know, taxes, keeping taxes down. Um, you know, let, making sure that uh, spending was within reason. So my district cared a lot about fiscal issues. And my sort of theory was, I was very particularly liberal on a lot of civil rights issues. I cared a lot about the criminal justice system. I cared a lot about civil rights. And, and so my theory was, if I really pretty much protected the economic interests of my constituents that that uh, maybe they would forgive some of my other activities. You and, were known as very liberal socially, the, the so yeah, social issues. Yeah, I probably. And, and so, so anyway, um, but Shabazz, um, see I would go door to door and people would like me and Shabazz would go door to door and they would like him. So people would have Shabazz and Edelman signs in their lawn. They would have both signs in their lawn. And Shabazz could never understand this because he was so, I think Shabazz was pretty ideological. And the idea of sort of running like I did where you downplay ideology and you just run on kind of being responsive and constituent service and showing up and that sort of thing, I mean, that wasn't his style. So uh, I think he was a little bit uh, annoyed by seeing Edelman and Shabazz signs on the same lawn. And um, in fact, it was, this is a sort of a funny little story. When I first got put on the bench in 97, I got invited to speak in Madison at the Federal Bar Association for this district. And Shabazz, of course, who was a federal judge here, was there. So I was giving a talk, and I made this point about Shabazz, and I represented the same district, and that was a little-known fact. And I said, um, and uh, I, I said, uh, and uh, sometimes people even put our signs on the, you know, same people put their signs on the lawn, and so Shabazz. Uh, um, and I said, John. And I said, John always was confused by this because he could never understand how the people in that district could elect both him and me. And Shabazz jumped up in the middle of my speech. This was quite funny. And he said, No, no, that's not right. I could never understand how they elected you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyway, but it, it, was, it was sort of amusing to have me and Shabazz down there together. And. Now, considering the makeup of the district, your district, as it changed and as more people 
uh, emigrated out of the city, the district became more conservative. Yeah, more, more, ever more, and, more, and more. And you more. kept getting reelected. Yeah, I know. I was, and that just it just fried them. I mean, they just couldn't understand that. Well, if you'd ring enough doorbells and you'd do enough uh, constituent services and you uh, don't get too far out on a limb and you don't get the best opponents in the world and you kind of learn how to run campaigns and, 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 and uh, you know, you learn how to seize on your opponent's errors if they're, if they make any, you know, you can hang on, and that's kind of what I did. Now they finally, essentially, if I, I don't think this is twisting the story, they <laughs> got you out of the district finally by letting you be appointed to the federal bench. Yeah, I mean, it was an advantage having that district and having that conservative district then, because finally when, when Clinton appointed me to the bench, the Republicans controlled the U.S. Senate. And uh, they could easily have stopped me from being confirmed, but I had a lot of support from the Republicans in Wisconsin who... Uh, uh, wanted you out. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could say they, they wanted me out. And uh, so, um, and I was happy to oblige them if they would put me on the federal bench. And then your district was won, won by a Republican. Of course, yeah, and now it's, you know, the Democrats don't seem to even run candidates hardly. Hmm. So, well, let's go back to your uh, your service in the Senate. Then. Okay. Uh, what, looking back on it, let's say in the '70s, you served 20 years. So, of course, the issues weren't always the same. But what do you look back on? Were the big issues, the important issues at the time? Well, the issues are always the same, really. I mean, the, the economic issues usually predominate you know, taxes and spending and the economy and I mean those, I don't think those things really ever change much. A lot, there's a lot of specific issues. When I got in I ran a lot, I, I made a big fuss out of a lot of, see I always had to look for issues that were, that I cared about but that weren't so ideologically divisive. So I got very involved in like good government issues at the beginning, and you know, actually all through my career. Ethics, lobbying, open government, open records. Um, so I, I was actually a very, very productive, effective legislator in those areas. When, I mean, my first term up there, I authored a, a, a pretty comprehensive state ethics code for legislators and all other public officials, which has never really been changed much. That's been tweaked here and there since then, various scandals and stuff. But uh, basically that ethics bill was sort of a model bill that, that uh, and it's pretty much, rem the principles of that bill have remained in effect ever since. Same with lobbying. Um, I cared a lot about like lobbying disclosure by prints by companies and groups that hire lobbyists and buy lobbyists and so requiring a bill that that would require disclosure and certain amount of uh, public information and all that and same with that now that's been tweaked and changed because there's you know over the years there's always more scandals and and then whenever there's a scandal then people want to change the law and but <coughs> nevertheless, the lobbying law that I sponsored was has pretty much remained. The principles are the same. I, you know, I authored the uh, open records law, which uh, unfortunately that law got it's st most of it's still in effect, but one important part of it got screwed up by the Wisconsin Supreme Court and has never been fixed, and that's this. Uh, part about, they call it the Wozniki. It was a Wozniki case, which was a horrible Wisconsin Supreme Court decision, which I think even was authored by my old colleague, Justice Bablich, who I did not agree with at all when it came to some of these good government issues. And I think that that Wozniki bill really put a big chunk of... Now that, that allowed 
employees to uh, object to the release of yeah. records concerning them. Yeah, exactly. And then that would go to court. And well, once they allow them to object, then it's, you know, then they can s oh, screw it up for indefinitely, and it basically makes a lot less public disclosure. And, but anyway, I was very proud of enacting, of authoring an open records law, and I was also involved in maintaining a strong open meetings law that was actually enacted before I got there in uh, before I got two years before I got there so that's a kind of an example and then I would get involved in other kinds of issues actually I you know now again 30 years later drunk driving is a big issue but it was even a actually Wisconsin's drunk driving law in many respects is is pretty good I mean we we passed I, I authored a law in 1980 and there was so much opposition to it that the only way we could get it passed is if I stuck it into the budget as a budget amendment. And in those days, um, see, people the, in the Democratic caucus, people wanted to help me pretty much because they knew I had a really tough district. And if I could get some legislative achievements to go back and show my constituents that I was effective, that would really help me. So. I, I was able to like get a drunk driving bill, which really was a pretty strong bill in the sense that it it made the point one oh standard now it's point oh eight but it made the point one oh standard an automatic conviction see in the in the old days point one oh was a kind of like you could put that in as evidence, but it didn't really you could still be you know you could come back and say, well, I can hold my liquor mm -hmm. even though I'm point one oh that's not much for me because you know, I'm, I, and you'd be surprised how many people would, would uh, succeed with that defense. And not only they would succeed, that prosecutors then would have less leverage and they would let people plead to lower f offenses like reckless and reckless driving and all sorts of stuff like that. So the drunk driving bill that I authored, which really was prompted by a, a, a fatality of a little kid who was hit in my district in Exonia, the town of Exonia, was um, a pretty major achievement, and that's been the form. You know, it's, that's been the basis for the law ever since. And then later on, in the late, I think it was the late '80s. I can't remember exactly. I got real involved with Mary Lou Munson and, and passed the uh, marital property law, which changed the whole arrangement for married people owning property, and was much strongly supported by many women's groups and and uh, that had failed for a couple sessions before I got involved but but I, I was good I knew how to pass bills like I, I knew that the marital property law we needed some Republican support and I knew that Don Hannaway who was then a colleague in the state Senate later became Attorney General and then a judge in I think in uh, Brown County um, he had four daughters and he was a little soft on the marital property bill, unlike some of his colleagues. And so uh, we worked with him and, and really basically said, Don, here's the principles we care about. But, you know, beyond that, if you want to tweak this bill in all kinds of ways, fine. Do whatever you want to it. We, we, we only care about the fundamentals. So he had a lot of things that he wanted to change, and we accepted 95% of his changes, which didn't really affect the fundamental idea of the bill, which was that marriage was a partnership and that husband and wife had equal pro ownership of property during a marriage, that was really, the bill was really about that fundamental principle and all, as opposed to separate property during marriage, where the, the husband really had titled all the property and the wife didn't have property. I mean, that was how it was before. And so we didn't really care about some of the details. and. So with that, we worked out a deal, and Hannaway supported the bill and made a big, passionate speech and brought along a bunch of Republicans, and we got that passed too. So, so um, um, that was yeah, that was in the '80s. That was when Tony Earle was governor. I can't, when was he governor? He was governor from '82 to '86. Yeah. So that was in the mid '80s. So. Uh, you know, those are some of the issues that I was real active in. You didn't go around talking about guns, God, and uh, abortion, and gays, and... No, I didn't talk about those things. 
they were they were already big issues. Well, abortion was a, an issue. Guns, guns. I didn't hear much about guns in my district. So, you know, somewhat, but uh, there wasn't a lot of bills up here that were, you know, problems as I recall. Abortion was always an issue. You always had to deal with that, and I, I was known to be pro-choice, but I tried to not be, you know, to trumpet that and so it was always a tough issue and and uh, you know the the religious stuff see my district was sort of it was kind of a it was pretty middle class it was a lot of people that you know worked in maybe in service industries some of them worked in Milwaukee or Brookfield or places and they were not it was not a district that was uh, sort of what you might call social right issues. I mean, there were pockets of that in the district, but they were more. My district was more a kind of a pocketbook. If you you know if you could, if you could, uh, if they trusted you on the pocketbook issues, that you weren't going to spend all their money on, you know, in, in Milwaukee, or you weren't going to spend take all their, t you know, raise all their taxes and tax the rich too much and all that. If you, if they, if they felt you were okay on that stuff, they didn't get too upset about the rest of it. That's sort of how I felt about it. Any big disappointments during your long 20 years? Um, something you didn't get done or, so, or regret? Maybe something you wish you voted the other way or? Well, I, I ran for Congress a couple more times during that period, and might have been that might have been fun. Although now I'm not sure if I think I might be better off. Um, in terms of legislation, I guess there were. I mean, I was always sort of pretty pragmatic, and. Um, I, I, about the late 80s, maybe in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, when the Republicans, see the Republicans took over the Senate, I enacted a lot of bills, authored a lot of bills in maybe the first 10 years I was there. And then, um, I, I, I guess there was, there was still, um, for a while the Republicans took over and then we were kind of playing defense and um, uh, I don't remember any great regrets about anything. I generally th th was very thoughtful about my votes, and my theory was I, I voted my I voted my conscience almost all the time. But I also was sensitive to when a vote could really get me into big trouble. And I tried to, to, uh, I tried to uh, not uh, to avoid those votes. Because I knew I was so vulnerable in that district that I didn't want to give the Republicans any real easy target. So sometimes I would vote for the Republican budgets and vote against the Democratic budgets, because the budgets were always the most highly politicized documents. And usually when I could vote against a Democratic budget, they didn't need me. The Democrats didn't need me. And they had a bigger majority. Yeah, they had a bigger majority, and so they didn't really need me to vote for it, and so they let me off the hook. And, and they understood they yeah, your needs. Huh? Yeah, they understood. And uh, I suppose if there's one, one, one regret that occurs to me, it's that our campaign finance laws, which I was very much involved in in the early days, and we, pre we actually had some fairly decent campaign finance laws. You might remember one of my aides for a long time was Gail Shea. And before she had been my aide, she was the lobbyist for Common Cause in Wisconsin. So I was the, uh, the uh, Kind of, I got real involved, and she was involved in campaign finance, and we enacted a really good law. But see, what happened is the U.S. Supreme Court cases, which sort of 
allowed all these independent expenditures like the kind you see in some of these, all these races now. See, I could not get elected today in Wisconsin to the state legislature in the district I was in. There would be no way because, let me talk about the money. My first campaign for the state Senate, the campaign against Devon, I think I spent about fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. My 1980 campaign was maybe, you see, you had campaign limits. They had public funding. So you would take a public grant. The public grant was maybe $10,000. And then you could raise another twenty-five, And that was how much you could spend. So in 1980, I maybe spent $35,000 for the whole campaign or something like, you know. And, and the same in 84 and the same in 88. By around the early 90s, now it's starting to get up a little bit. And then by the time my last campaign, you know, now you got Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce and some of these groups running these independent ads where, like today, if I ran today in that district, there'd be a million dollars on television from these outside groups and you don't have any control over your campaign. So I could raise 100,000, 200,000, but it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be enough probably. It'd be like what happened in some of these judicial races where you get these groups, they come in and they use all this corporate money and they use money that's undisclosed and they say, oh, these are just issue ads. We're just telling, you know, they run these ads saying, they don't say elect or defeat, they say, call Lynn Edelman and tell him you want him to vote for this or something. And then they say, oh, that's not really a campaign ad. Except they run it a week before the election. They only run during the months before the yeah, election. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's just a travesty that we allow this stuff with all due respect. And, and these corporations can just get around the laws with those. It's just a, it's, it's done horrible things to our state. It's kind of done horrible things to our Wisconsin Supreme Court, which is now, as we speak today, there's huge questions raised about its legitimacy because of the Everybody, the one justice is facing disciplinary problems, and others, they, they, they allow, they, they say you don't have to recuse yourself no matter how much money somebody gives you. And as and, we speak, that was a very recent decision, four to three. Yeah, and and, the and, state and Supreme Court. Yeah. And essentially, they uh, there was a, uh, a proposal to uh, put a limit on that if you've got more than a thousand dollars or something from a group. If they came before you, you would have to recuse yourself. Right. They rejected it four to three. And they said not only a thousand, they rejected anything. They were not influenced by money. Duh. I mean. That's what they said. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know. So they lose credibility. So I think what's happened in politics in this country and this state and the country, with this sort of, you know, this sort of uh, influx of money is really not good. Now, unless the U.S. Supreme Court approves it, is there anything that can be done? Uh, approves, you know. Oh, well, there's some marginal things. I mean, I think they're going to. They've passed this. The legislature's passed this public funding for Supreme Court races. That unfortunately doesn't do anything about the independent expenditures. I would like to see a real attempt to made to try to really restrain these independent expenditures in judicial races because, after all, there's no reason to call up a judge and say you know, call up judge so-and-so and tell him that, like yeah, story. that's not the way the courts work, you know, so even though that might be a fig leaf of, of uh, in, in a legislative campaign, that's not the way judges, your courts work, so. Now the Wisconsin State Journal, among others, is saying that the situation is so bad that we ought to junk election of state judges. I, I think that's where we are now. And we should go to appointment. Well, I, I mean, look, this present system basically has failed. And we have a Wisconsin Supreme Court that's lost tremendous credibility among the public because of the situation it's in. So, you know, and it may well be that you can't get a court back that has that credibility unless we change the way its members are, 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 are done, are chosen. And, uh, you know, see, I think some of these outside groups, particularly the Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce, should never have done what they did. I mean, is it really in their interest? Is it really in the interest of the businessmen and women in the state of Wisconsin to have a court that's not credible? 
I mean, let's say they win a couple more cases a year that they wouldn't have won before. Okay, big deal. I mean, meanwhile, the whole state's got this court that's kind of looks like it's, uh, um, you know, it looks like it's not really worthy of respect. Now, of course, right now, you were appointed. You are appointed for life. Right. The argument against that is that there's no accountability. I mean, you, you put these people in there, and they're there oh, for, for life, and they're untouchable. Anybody, you know, my decisions, uh, and anybody, any federal judge's decisions can be appealed. And, uh, um, and uh, are, and the notion that, uh, the notion that there's no accountability, I think, is not right. I mean, the way judges should be accountable basically is to the law, and uh, sometimes the law is uh, not sort of majoritarian. It's, I mean, I think one of the reasons federal judges have life tenure is to protect people's rights, even though those rights aren't popular. So, is that a form of not being accountable? I think if you follow the law, you should be accountable to, you should be accountable to the law, but not to television ads which say, you know, Judge X is letting criminals out, even though the Constitution may have required <laughs> that decision, you know. So, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I mean, the, the federal benches are, uh, uh, as far as I can tell, it's pretty much people that, uh, are very conscientious. You know. Have you been reversed? Oh, sure. Everybody gets reversed. I don't think a lot. I mean, ninety percent of the time, it's I'm affirmed. But any particular ones you remember that that you might have been particularly annoyed at, or think that? Well, you're. All, I mean, they always. You know. I mean, it's like it's like what is the famous saying? Um, um, the court of a, the Supreme Court is. Uh, it's not final because it's right. It's right because it's final. <laughs> so, you know. any that stand out? Have you been involved as a judge with particularly high-profile cases? A few, you, a few. You might want to know about. Well, I mean, I've granted a few petitions for writs of habeas corpus, which were pretty high-profile, and most of them have been affirmed. Basically, those I, I ruled that a a state court made a constitutional error, and uh, in a few high-profile cases, that Oswald case down in Waukesha, where it was a policeman was killed, and it was a pretty horrible case. And I said that there was a infirmity in the way the jury was selected, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the, we didn't, they didn't get a fair, an impartial jury, and uh, reversed the conviction. They had to retry him, and they convicted him, but which is appropriate based on the facts, but they did it in, in the right way. So that was pretty high profile. So if you were an elected judge, somebody could say, oh, he let this criminal off. That's what the... Uh, that's what they said in the... That's what the ad would say if you were... Of course, of course, of so course. And I think that that's a, a real problem now. I mean, I think that elected judges have to, you know, you don't, you really don't want them thinking about, well, gee, if I follow the Constitution, is this going to get me kicked off the bench in the next election? That's, that's not so great. We had a case uh, in the, the 60s uh, when uh, a state Supreme Court justice was defeated, very unusual, an incumbent, because he let, let the Milwaukee Braves go. Oh, yeah, George Curry. And I'm no lawyer, but apparently he had no choice. I mean, the right. law... You follow the law. There was no recourse in the law for right. Milwaukee to keep them. Right. But the campaign was, he let him go. Right. So it's tough. I mean, it's tough to... How do you deal with that stuff? So you, you, you think it may be an appointed system for the state? Would be? Well, I, I, you know, I don't know that. I think we have to... Wouldn't we have to change the Constitution? I so. And I, I think it might be hard to get to that, but... And I don't really have any problem with elected judiciary as long as the... See, my, I think it's always worked fairly well, not perfect, 
But it's worked fairly well until you got these independent expenditures. Because once you get these independent expenditures, the candidate no longer controls the campaign. He no longer controls the dialogue. No longer controls the debate. He can't say what he wants to. And, um, and also, he doesn't need support. I mean, like Justice Gableman, the guy who got elected with all those WMC issue ads, would he have had a chance if independent expenditures were not allowed? I, I don't think so. I don't think he would have raised very much money. I mean, he was like not very well known. I don't think anybody had a great high regard for him as a jurist. So where would he have gone to get support? He wouldn't have been able to. So why wouldn't he have been able to? Because there's probably a good reason that he wouldn't have been able to. But when you get all these independent expenditures, you don't even need to get support because they, they do it for you. And you don't have any say over it. And you don't have any, you know. I think it was a little before you left the Senate that we had our first million dollar state Senate campaign, John Urbanbach in Middleton. Oh, that uh, was after I left. After you left. Yeah. Uh, but in that one, I, rem I covered that one, I remember that one very well. Urbanbach was the fourth highest spender. Be in the campaign. Yeah, the, the two candidates were both outspent by WMC and the teachers' union. Right. And the Republican also outspent him, so he was the fourth. Yeah, I mean, highest. that's not. He won, but he was the fourth highest yeah. element in the campaign. Yeah, I could never have functioned in, in that kind of a system because if the teachers' union was sort of wanted to help me, they would have gone on television in my district and said, oh, Edelman's for binding arbitration so that the local school boards lose control of, and, and, I, and they would have probably lost me more votes with their ads than, you know, I, was, I always had a hard time with it, like the teachers union in my district because they always wanted me to support things that the district didn't want and so I would always, uh, you know, wind up in conflicts with them and stuff. It's always interesting to me. Only those who are judges, I think, can really <laughs> understand what it's like to be a judge. But uh, approaching the uh, the job, uh, for instance, you're, uh, you're operating under sentencing guidelines uh, passed by Congress. How much leeway do you have? And, and uh, what do you think about when you sentence somebody? Well, the guidelines weren't passed by Congress. Congress passed a statute in uh, um, I guess it was finally went into effect in the mid 80s and it set up a, sta a national sentencing commission and then the commission was supposed to create these guidelines and I think that the commission uh, pretty much butchered the job and created a way much too much detail and I'm not a big fan of guidelines period I think that they kind of take, uh, I think they, it, it, sentencing is really hard and it requires a lot of thought and by having guidelines I think they make it, judges aren't required to put in the thought that they would have to do if they didn't have these guidelines. So I've, I never liked them and then after, in a case called Booker in 2005, um, the Supreme Court held that the federal sentencing guidelines in many, in a certain respect, was were unconstitutional. Uh, basically, the automatic increases in penalties based on certain facts, which the guidelines relied on, um, violated the uh, defendant's right to a trial by jury. That is, courts were finding facts that caused mandatory increases in sentences based on the guidelines. If it was done with a gun, it's an extra 10 years. That's what right, like. and, and the, the, but that system deprived the defendant of having the jury as is, as is uh, he's entitled to by the Sixth Amendment find whether in fact he had the gun. See, the way the guidelines worked, the court would make a decision, well, did he have a gun? And if he had a gun, then it was like way more time. But the defendant didn't have a right to a jury f decision on whether he had a gun. And so that was the problem with the guidelines. And um, so since then, the courts have made, the US Supreme Court has made clear that the guidelines are advisory and uh, that judges have a lot of discretion. So the system now is way, way, way more fair than uh, it was uh, 
before 2005. I mean, there's still a lot of mandatory minimum sentences. Those aren't guidelines. Those are statutory mandates that are enacted not by a commission, but by Congress. And in many respects, those are not uh, helpful either. But uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the, the, the whole issue of criminal justice and penalties and punishment is hugely uh, sensitive politically. You know, no legislator wants to be tagged with a soft on crime. And so, and the whole issue of criminal justice has become, and over the years, for the last 30 or 40 years, you know, really, it, it's been a political, uh, it's been very politicized. And so it's very hard to kind of come up with real rational thoughtful, well thought out policies because, you know, in anything that's so politicized that it's, it's hard sometimes to do it well if you're so concerned about somebody uh, beating up on you for being weak. So we have a system that we have the highest, we have, you know, we have something in this country which um, I think is somewhat new in the last you know, t 20 years or so, and people are becoming much more aware of it. I mean, w when I first started out in politics, you never heard the phrase mass incarceration, but you hear it a lot now, and w what it basically means is uh, that the, there, there's so many people in prison in this country, the percentage of people in prison is much higher than I think any other country, you know, in the world other than maybe there, I mean, there might be a couple that are comparable. And the articles I've read say it's higher than any country ever, percentage of yeah. the population locked up. So Very high. Does we that mean we're the, the nastiest, most criminal-minded people in the history of the world? Well, <laughs> it means that we haven't figured out, a, we haven't sort of, I mean, it doesn't help us. Sure, there are some people that are really <coughs> dangerous that have to be locked up, and but I don't think that's, I think many of the people that are in prison now do not fall into that category, but we have not figured out a better, you know, good ways to deal with them, and it's not an easy system, a solution, it's not an easy problem to solve, and it requires a lot of, probably a lot of things that uh, are politically difficult to accomplish. But you could make the argument that the mass incarceration that we have actually disrupts certain minority communities with so many of the men. It's largely a male phenomenon and largely a young male phenomenon, although that's even changing. But you take away all these men from the community and you kind of create even uh, more disruption. Um, and, uh, but, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that are serious thinkers about this problem, but the, the politics of dealing with it are are difficult. So you don't have anybody in Congress really championing a new approach to criminal justice. I mean, Senator Jim Webb from West Virginia has a program to set up a commission to study the problem, which hardly is a very radical idea to have a commission. And I don't even know if that's going to pass. So. so during your time in the legislature, uh, the legislature pretty much ratcheted up the... Uh, no, it was mostly reasons. after I left. The, the truth in sentencing law came after I left. And I, and I actually, one of the things I'm fairly proud of during my stay is when I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I, I tried to maintain the, as much rationality as I could in the criminal justice system. and. Uh, you know, the Wisconsin never enacted a death penalty, and I was, uh, I, I, uh, you know, Alan Lassay would inter introduce a bill every year and put it in my committee, and and uh, we didn't have that truth in sentencing law, which is a misnomer and which just causes people to do more time, many of whom don't, don't, uh, it's not really, doesn't serve any useful purpose. Um, 
so I, I actually, I think, was responsible for maintaining a certain element of sanity in the criminal justice system. And frankly, I don't know that there's anybody now who uh, does that as much. Although there's... Never be accused of being soft on crime. Right. Although, although, see, I think that's sort of... People are always so afraid. But I represented a Republican suburban district and you'd think that that's you know the, the, that's some sort of a target audience, but you know, there's not a lot of crime in that kind of a district. There was not a lot of crime in my district, and many times I found I could explain to people why some of these tough on crime laws really didn't make a lot of sense. Plus, a lot of families, you know, have somebody that their friend or relative or somebody that's had a drug problem, and they're not totally insensitive to how human beings can get off the track a little bit without completely being uh, a danger to the public. And so I, I found actually a lot more, let me, to go back to what I said about the Devitt campaign, where all these local officials are championing Devitt's election, and the, but the public had more sense than they did, I think to some extent on the criminal justice issue, that's another issue where the public is way, way more sort of sensible than politicians give them credit for. I mean, politicians are so scared of being labeled, you know, soft on crime when actually if they would take the time and the effort and go out and try to explain what the issues are, what's at stake to their constituents, they would find a lot more understanding than they, uh, you know, think might be there. Nobody, they, the Republicans ran against me six different elections, and they would always bring up the crime issue because that was I was judiciary and I was known as somebody who didn't like all these tough on crime bills. They never won. I mean, that was always their focus, you know, crime, blah blah blah. It never worked. So that always taught me that people were sometimes more sensible than they were given credit for. Do you think the public, for example, might be ready for decriminalization of marijuana? Well, I don't know. That's but sort of judges a... Judges don't poll the public either. No, and, and that's, a, that's a, you know, I th that's sort of a, a high profile, high sort of... Um, yeah, maybe. But I, I think the more important issue is sort of not so much decriminalization of this or that, but because effectively nobody goes to jail for a first offense small quantity of marijuana anyway. So that's not really an issue that's important. I mean, it might be important in some way, but, you know, I don't think anybody who's got a small amount of marijuana, um, who's not a seller and who's not a repeat offender, gets in much trouble. Where the harder decisions are and the more important ones are some of these length of time for certain, often nonviolent, but even sometimes something that's more serious. I mean, the amounts of time that people do is so great that it really just um, makes it, I mean, it sort of ends any possibility of hope for them or their family or it really runs counter to the idea of trying to you know, have some re rehabilitation. And I, I actually believe in rehabilitation. I've had many, many, many people come before me where, you know, I've uh, created some sort of a sentence where they didn't have to go to prison or if they did have to go to, they didn't have to go for very long and there was a lot of supervision and they were watched and monitored carefully and a fairly large number have turned out okay and don't repeat kind of get 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 on the right track. So I, I think this notion that you just punish and you don't try and rehabilitate and that's some, you know, liberal wishy squishy word is just completely wrong. Well that's where I was going next on, on sentencing. Yeah. Now the majority of your cases are not criminal cases, but but when right. you have somebody to sentence, is that the toughest decision you have to make? Well it's not it's, it's, sometimes it's their hard, sometimes they're real hard. Uh, you know, they're tough decisions because you're dealing with somebody's freedom and that's, you know, some of them 
it's a pretty obvious answer if somebody's really a menace and so forth. But sometimes it's, uh, you know, sometimes there are, some are, it's, a, it's a hard decision. It requires a lot of thought. And that's one of the reasons I don't think so much of guidelines, because I think they, they, a lot of times they sort of infantilize judges and, and turn judges into kind of technicians. And I mean, if you just got some number out there off a chart, well, you know, what, what kind of a judge are you? I mean, you know, you can do, you can have a, you know, you just need a computer. You ever second guessed yourself? Sure, a lot of times. And I'm sure I've made many mistakes. Anybody that you let off lightly uh, then run amok? Well, actually, not that I know of, although I've let people off lightly and have them return. And when I would hoped and thought maybe they wouldn't. Now, I don't think they've run amok, <laughs> but they've maybe done something illegal. Uh, so that is one of the toughest things? Actually, well, it's, sentencing. It's sometimes it's it's tough. Yeah, it is tough. But a lot of things about the job are tough. Just figuring out how to decide a case sometimes is tough. Just a civil case without any criminal justice at all. It's hard. How do you? You say you give a lot of thought to sentencing. What sort of research can you do? I mean, how can you guess what the person is going to be like, say, ten years from now? Well, you can't. I mean, you can. You have to, but. You know, you look at the past. You look at the. You look at everything. It's uh, it's an art, not a science. You look at uh, his background. You look at his recent past, where where the defendant seems to be going. What what under what circumstances can the defendant sort of function well, and what can he? And and you come you you come up with an educated guess, at least. You call it educated. It might just be a guess, but <laughs> but you know, but it's you do it as educated as you can. Now, with politicians seemingly wanting to be tough on crime, and we hear that now we have a uh, a, a prison industrial complex that has a vested interest in keeping all these people in prison. So, well, that's a problem. You, if you want to de-escalate from this, how do you do it? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it's true when you get, like in California, the prison guard lobby is one of the strongest lobbies in the legislature. I mean, and uh, they don't want to have fewer prisons. They probably want more prisons. More, you know, it's more, they thrive on prisons. So, you know, when you create these vested interests, in continuing structures that are not so great. It's just like any, you know, lobby group. Look at all the trouble they're having reforming the fa financial system. I mean, they want to pass a consumer agency to in Washington now to, to try to keep a little more watch over the banks, which played a huge part in driving us into this financial crisis that, you know, now we've got 10% unemployment. Well. The, the banking lobby, you would think the, you know, maybe people could pass it, but the banking lobby is fighting that off. I mean, the, the, some of these powerful interest groups are, are uh, you know, are very powerful, and they, and they uh, have a great impact on public policy. Now, California's budget is so terrible, I understand, that they're releasing hundreds, thousands of prisoners because they can't afford them. Is, is, is the economy going to turn around on that? Well, they, they're, they're California is a, has its own pathology with its Proposition 13, and then you have to, you can't pass a budget without a super majority, I think two-thirds. So there's all kinds of rules in California which gives a small minority great more power. So if you need two-thirds to pass a budget, um, you know, then the the this, these hardliners that will never increase taxes no matter what have so much power that you're hamstrung. So California's problems go way beyond their penal system. We used to say that California was the bellwether, that uh, as California goes, the rest of the country will go a few years later. Uh, if we have that to look forward to. 
<laughs> well, I mean, it, it shows us what how, what problems you can have from uh, the success of a referendum process where they have direct legislation, because that's caused a lot of the problem. If you were starting out today, or if, would you have advice to a young person? You think uh, would you advise a young person to get into politics today? Well, we need some. We sort of need them. It's it's not. Uh, I don't think it's quite as attractive as when I started. It was attractive. Wisconsin was a great state. I mean, it still is, but in those days, it was like Gaylord Nelson's advice. You want to get involved in politics in Wisconsin, you don't have to go to see any power broker. You just get a few friends together and see if you can raise a few bucks and just start running. It's a very open state, you know, very not hard to get into it. You just have to have a little talent, a little energy. You start running and there's no party bosses and there's no machines and there's no nobody you have to go bow and scrape before and it's a very open state and and I think that's still the case here but I think some of the some of the campaign finance issues are, are make it less attractive. Uh, you say having a little energy. It sounds from your story and what I've heard from other politicians that one of the main qualification is a very high energy level. It helps. <laughs> All that going door to door yeah, and, it and helps. The meetings and traveling back and forth right. to Madison and right. on and on and on. Right. You got to be driven? Yeah. I would say driven. <laughs> That's a fair description, I think. Driven. Yeah, what, what drove you? Well, <laughs> oh, I guess my father's driven. I guess uh, it's sort of a family trait. <laughs> <laughs> For success, not, not politics specifically. Yeah, but just yeah, really. Well, you 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 know you pick your you pick your avenue and then you go. So, while your family was not not political, did you discuss politics at the dinner? Well, my mother was more political. My father was less so. He was more of a businessman. But, but the uh, impetus was for. You know, whatever it is, put everything into it and be a success, is that? Uh, well, I think that's a good chunk of it, yeah. <laughs> now, your father was a successful business person? Right. Which, Edelman? Yeah. Dry cleaner? Yeah. Yeah, the, the chain of yeah. dry cleaning yeah. stores in yeah. Milwaukee. Yeah. Highly successful. Yeah. Are they still going, by the way? No, he sold them many, many, many years ago. He yeah. sold them. So. And so... The advice to a 25-year-old today, could they get started the same way you did? I think so. Yeah, I think so. you got to have a lot of drive, that energy, that's for sure. <laughs> so, Anything you want to add for no, posterity? No, I don't. <laughs> posterity? <laughs> well, I can't think of anything that I haven't said. You know. Well, thanks very much then. Okay. I've enjoyed this for a lot. Okay, good. Well, it's a pleasure. You. Good. Thank you.